So I want to study today, Lamed Ches. We'll just look at the Agadita at the bottom of Lamed Zayin Amid Beis, Amr Ab Yochanan. And this is approximately eight lines up before the end of Lamed Zayin Amid Beis. And we're talking about Tnufa when we wave the Shteh Lechem, the Kivsei Atzeres, and we have the same halacha with regard to the lulav, this halacha of nanuim. Molich umevi, what is the symbolism of the six directions of molich umevi? Four directions, north, east, west, and south, and then up and down. So Yochan points out that Maila. Umorid Lemisha Shamay Varat Shalo that Molech Umevi Lemisha Arba Rucho Shalo. So when he extends the Lulav Molech and then maybe he brings it back in, then he is praising Almighty God because the world has four different directions. So this corresponds to the four different directions of God who owns all four, obviously. And Malu Morid, when he goes up and he goes down, that's Lamisha Shamayim Va'ar Shalo. So that's a representative, not of the four directions, but rather the Shamayim and the Aritz. But Marava Masnu Hachi, there was a different explanation or, or shall we say, Lishna, a tradition in Eretz Yisrael. Om Rabbi Chama Bar Ukva, Om Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Chanina, Molich Umevi Kidei Latzar Ruchos Ros. So we have something called Ruchos Ros, and somehow the Tnufa would ward off these Ruchos in all four directions. Malu Morid, Kidei Latzar Tzlolim Ron. So there were some dues that fell from Chamayim that were not helpful. They were a negative kind of do. And for that, he would be molich malu umori, going up and going down, warding off these uh, mazikim, which are called tlolim roin. On Rabbi Yossi bar oven vitem Rabbi Yossi bar zvila zoso meres. Let's derive from this. And here we're going to start Lamed Ches. Shiare mitzvah ma'akvim es ha'puronios. And Rashi says this is a kalvachomer of sorts. That even something which is really only shirayim. Rashi says, eno ikar la'akev kaparo. Let's say in a carbon, these kinds of shakings and wavings are not critical. But nevertheless, they still have a tremendous power to them. You see the power of something which is only shiari mitzvah to overcome all sorts of harmful dues and wins. The Amarav of Belulav, and the same thing applies to a lulav. So we have the four directions and the up and the down. As Rashi points out, Molech who may be malo more. Rav Acha bar Yaakov mamtile who Rashi says mamtile Molech who maisi mevi. So it means going out and going in. Amrani would declare. Dain gira be ene de sitna. Rashi says, Zechets. So gira is a chets, it's an arrow. The ene of shall satan. I'm shooting it into the eyes of the satan. And Rashi says, She ene bo koach le natek neolenu ol mitzvahs. The satan is desperately trying to undermine our, our dedication to mitzvahs. 
the love milsahi, but the Gemara says, we should not make that declaration. What you're doing is you're really, you're really provoking him. Rashi says, Yisgarabo Sotan Shri Yitzahara, the Asienu, Lissos, Me'alkono, the Yimsar Atzmo, Aladovo. At some points, the Yitzahara, or the, another word for it would be the Satan, becomes very, like, desperate, like kicks in all directions. And it's really strange because it's sort of counterintuitive. Dafka, when a Jew is doing well, that's when he activates the Sitchakra because the Sitchakra feels he's losing the battle. So he shoots in all directions. And that's why if you antagonize the Yetzirah and the Satan by saying, you know what, I'm shooting arrows into your eyes, meaning I'm the boss over here. You can't control me but rather the opposite is true, then he starts getting all activated, all, we say in Yiddish, to hit, you know, it gets all heated up. In certain Hasidic works, they say that Dafka, when a person starts out on his path of Avodah Hashem, that's when the Satan becomes so active. And a person mm-hmm. starts making a, a step forward and then he realizes he's going backwards. What happened over here? He was putting in all his great effort to move forward, to come closer to the Almighty. And he got thrown backwards by the hours of the Satan. Because once again, the Sutton thought he had this guy in his back pocket. He was winning the battle. And now he sees it's not so simple. This guy is now motivated and inspired to move forward. So at that point, the Sutton sort of doubles his efforts and makes it even more difficult of a barrier for the person to overcome. All right. Now we start the mission. Misha Baba Derech. He's on the road. And he's coming home, but he doesn't have access to a lulav. And it's daytime. Which literally means that he should take it on his table. What do you mean on his table? He apparently started his meal and he has to interrupt his meal for the sake of the mitzvah of Lulav. Rashi says, <laughs> He came home. He was very hungry after a long trip. He should have taken the Lulav immediately. Instead, he sat down to satiate his appetite. Rashi says, And the Gemara is not going to be happy about this because as a general rule, we don't demand of a person to interrupt his su'uda for the purpose of fulfilling a mitzvah. Instead, we tell him, we tell him, wait till he finishes his meal. And we'll see that in Masech Tepsochim, the Gemara is going to quote, for some reason, and the Gemara is going to go back and forth on this. This is the exception to the rule. And we have to understand why. Why is he obligated to stop in the middle of his meal in order to fulfill the mitzvah of Lula? Lo natal chakras. Now the Mishnah goes on to a different discussion, a different topic. When is the latest time for the mitzvah of Lula? L'chat chila, it should be during chakras. But Yito Ben Arbayim, he could take the Lulav in the afternoon and so in event that he missed the morning. And the afternoon ends with Shkia Sachama, Shekola Yom Koshal Lulav. Lulav is a day mitzvah. 
the Gemara, actually the Mishnah, at the end of the the Megillah will differentiate between day mitzvahs and night mitzvahs. And the Mishnah establishes the principle that day mitzvahs can be fulfilled the entire day, night mitzvahs the entire night. And Lulav is a day mitzvah. So the Gemara now immediately asks the following question. Amrit, no al shulchan, no lememer demafsik. The language of the mission indicates he has to interrupt his meal in order to take the lulav. Uremini, and I'll ask you a kasha from a Mishnah. Oh, I mentioned Psachim, but it's also in Shabbos. And the Mishnah has an entire list of that which I'm not allowed to do, Samach Lemincha. Again, this has nothing to do with Shabbos, per se. I'm just doing even a weekday, which happens to be on Daftes <coughs> in Mesech the Shabbos. So, for example, there are certain activities that are extended over time, like taking a haircut. It's not a proper time to take a haircut when it's mincha time, because before you know it, you might get uh, so involved in the haircut that you'll miss mincha. Now, amongst the list of those activities that you should not begin samach mincha is eat, beginning a meal. However, the Mishnah then says, what happens to the Eved if you started one of those activities which you shouldn't have done? Do we force you to interrupt in the middle of the activity and Davin Mincha? Or will we say, finish what you started and then Davin Mincha? And the Mishnah says, Im ischilu ein mafsikin. We're not going to force you to interrupt your meal for the sake of that mitzvah. And on that list, of those activities that you should avoid beginning when it's time for mincha is eating a meal. You're not supposed to begin a meal, but if you did and you started, we're not going to penalize you, but rather we're going to allow you to finish the meal and then to daven mincha. So why is it that in the case of Lulav, the Mishnah implies I mean, it's almost explicit that you have to stop your meal in order to take the lulav, whereas for the tefillah mincha, you don't have to stop your meal if you started it for the sake of mincha. You're allowed to finish your meal and aim up seeking. Now, the structure of this sugya is a little bit different, a little bit... Uh, what we call a Yotze Dauphin. It's not your typical structure. Usually, you know, when a Gemara finds a contradiction between two Mishnayas, if there's a simple, straightforward distinction, the Gemara offers that first. In this case, the Gemara is going to quote an answer to reconcile this theory from Rav Safra, and it's a very sophisticated answer, and we don't know exactly why, the, why Rav Safra had to give this answer. The answer to this question is so obvious. The mitzvah of mincha is only a mitzvah de Rabbana, whereas the mitzvah of lulav is a mitzvah de raisa. We're not going to play around with a mitzvah de raisa. But on the other hand, what is the mitzvah in our mishnah? We know that lulav on the first day is de raisa, and in the balance of the holiday, certainly here in Eretz Yisrael, in Chutzar, it's you wait another day, it's all the Rabbana. Let's assume for argument's sake that our mission is talking on the first day of Sukkot. He returns from a long trip on the first day of Sukkot and he got involved in eating his meal. This is a mitzvah do rice. We're not going to let you finish your meal. We don't want to play with fire. Mincha is only the Rabbana. 
and even according to the Rambam, against the Ramban, that Tfila is Doraisa, but not Mincha. Tfila Doraisa means once a day, Davin Shachris, he fulfilled his Doraisa. The Rabbana required Mincha, and the Rabbana are not going to force him to stop his meal midway. But Rav Safra seems to be assuming an equation between Lulav and Tfila. They're both Doraisa, the both Rabbana, and whatever it is. And therefore, he has to come up with another answer. We don't know why. The distinction seems so obvious. And that's what this sugi is going to sweat and toil to figure out why Rav Safa couldn't say that which was obvious. Instead, he says, Now that means that in the case of Mishnah Shabbos, Masech the Shabbos, it's Ika Shehuspio, let him finish his meal. He still has plenty of time to do Mincha. It wasn't the last segment of the day before Shkia. We're not worried that as a result of his meal, he's so preoccupied that he will ignore the mitzvah of Davani Min. But in our Mishnah here, Masech the Sukkah, we're dealing with a case where it's getting close to nightfall. In fact, if he doesn't interrupt his meal, it would seem that he does not have the ability to fulfill the mitzvah of, of Lula. Now, if that's how the Gemara should be interpreted, Leka Shahus by Yom, then we should be raising the question, Pshita Maikamachmal. Why do I need the mission to tell me that he has to interrupt his meal if he'll forfeit the mitzvah of lulav if he doesn't do so? If it's leka shehus b'yo. What is the Mishnah coming to be mechadesh here that I wouldn't have known? So in the notes here, they quote a Sfas Emes. Now the Sfas Emes is not exactly addressing this question, but in my humble opinion, in the light of the Chiddush of the Sfas Emes, we might be able to come and answer to the question, Pshita Maikah Mashma. It's a tircha to ask a person to interrupt his meal. And the principle, the premise is that if all things are equal and it's not absolutely critical to have him perform the mitzvah now, let's give him a little more slack and why be matriachim to interrupt his meal midway. However, let's say he starts his meal and at this point in time, he still has a ways to go till Shkia. He, he, can, he can fit in the midst of Lulav. And he doesn't have to interrupt his meal now. Says the Svas Emes, since if he continues his meal, his Seuda, we know that it's going to conflict with Lulav then right now, he's obligated to interrupt his meal. Even though right now, it's not necessary really for him to interrupt his meal. There's still plenty of time. But the answer is that we view the Sa'uda as one entity. And we know that ultimately, because Lekha Shehus Biyom, there's going to be a head-on conflict between his Sa'uda and the Mitzvah of Lula. In such a case, the halach of mafsikin applies. That's the Chiddush of Amish. Mafsikin means now, immediately, interrupt your meal. Don't tell me, well, I have another half hour till Shkia. Because your meal is going to be extended past the half hour. So you yourself, admittedly, will have to interrupt your meal. We're going to, re we're going to require of you to interrupt your meal now in anticipation of the fact that you will have to interrupt your meal later on. Mm. 
And again, this Hasemis doesn't use this as an answer to our question, but I think it really uh, supplies an answer to our question. What is the Chiddush of our Mishnah? Right now, Yeslo Shuhus, Ika Shuhus, but before the meal ended, it's going to be Leka So head on to Liz. Now, I want to share with you a run, the run, which is quoted here. And maybe you can help me out because I don't understand the run, honestly. Okay. I got really stuck on this. The run comments on the Gemara statement here. That imeschilu ein mafsikim. The Gemara raises a contradiction to our Mishnah with regard to lulav from the Mishnah in Shabbos, which says imeschilu ein mafsikim. Now says the Ran, there seems to be a very simple difference between our Mishnah and the Mishnah in Shabbos. I'm not going through the Doraisa versus the Durabana. We'll get to that later. The Ran's problem is that the issue of Mafsikin or a Mafsikin is contingent, says the Ran, on whether or not he started his meal beheta. Did he have a right, according to Allah, to begin his meal. So the Ran assumes that he started his meal in the afternoon after he gears man mincha. I'm sorry, it's the opposite. I'm, I'm already asking my kasha on the Ran. Um, the Ran insists that he began his meal beheta. It was very early in the afternoon. It's not Plaga Mincha or whatever it is. And he was allowed to start his meal. But here we're dealing with a case on the day of Sukkot. The day of Sukkot, he's Chayav in, in Lula. He had no right to start his meal. Mm. He had forgotten or alternatively he was so famished from the Derech and he sat down and he ate a meal. He shouldn't have eaten that meal. And that's the Rand's assumption here, that the Gemara could have made that distinction. We'll see the later part of the sugya, that in Shabbos, in the Mishnah Shabbos, he started his meal behet. I'll tell you why I can't figure this out. Look at Rashi. Rashi di Ramaskalim Hishilu Ein Mafsik. Rashi is interpreting the Mishnah in Masech the Shabbos. It's not like going to the base hamerchot. He can't take a haircut. A whole bunch of activities that are enumerated there. He shouldn't start a din, a judgment, a litigation, and he shouldn't start, shouldn't start, should not start a meal. Then Rashi says, but the imischilu, I'm going to skip two words for a moment for pedagogic reasons. Umashcha sudas v'giazman mincha ain't mafsikin ain't tzarch lahafsik sudasal is palim. Take a look. Rashi says, and I will fill, fill in the two words that we skip. Ischilu kodem ha-mincha. Rashi is learning that we're talking about a case where he began his meal before Mincha. And that would mean So in the middle of his Suda, it became time for Mincha. Is then a Mafsi? But Rashi is certainly implying, I mean, again, in my mind, it's black and white, that if he had started his meal, not Kodem's Manaminfa, which is Rashi's language, but 
after Zman Amincha, then he would have to be Mafsa. How could the Ran tell me that the Mishnah Chavez is referring to someone who began his meal after the time for the for the mitzvah for the mitzvah for mincha? Unless the Ran means the following. Let me let me try to correct my perception of the Ran. Maybe what the Ran means is fakeret that our Mishnah here in Sukkah is addressing a case where he started his meal after the Zman, after the Zman of Chiyuv Luav, meaning after Debrit. And the Mishnah in Shabbos, as we saw in Rashi, is referring to a case where he started his meal before the Zman of Mincha. That's the only way I can reconcile the Ran with Rashi. But again, the Ran is is pointing out that there is a simple distinction between the two Mishnayas. So the Ran wants to know why, why does Rav Safra, and for that matter, Rova and the rest of the Sugya, why are they working overtime to reconcile the two? Says the Ran that the Mishnah in Shabbos is referring to a case where he started his meal after the time for Mincha. And that's the Ran's understanding of our sugya. Rashi is interpreting our sugya. And Rashi says he started his meal before the Zman Amin. So I understand that the Ran is bothered here. There's no steer between our Mishnah and the Mishnah and Chavez. But to come up with the answer that our sugya assumes that he started his meal in Shabbos, meaning Mincha time, in the same way that he started his meal here in Masech the Sukkah, in both cases, after the Zman HaChiyuv, after the Zman HaMitzvah, that's impossible. To assume that that's the Gemara's Kasha, that's against Rashi, because Rashi is interpreting our Gemara's Kasha, and he insists that he started the meal before Shas HaChiyuv. So I, 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 you know, as much as I tried to understand right. the Ran, I... I my kusha Dilma Hador, I saw the Rabbana. Now Mish is dealing with the mitzvah of Alakat and Lachem Yom Arichon. And that's why you have to interrupt your Seuda for a mitzvah to Raisa. And the mitzvah of Mincha and Sech the Chavis is only the Rabbana. And that's true even according to the Ramam Chita that feels the Raisa, but not feels Mincha. Eloma Rava, Ikasha, Kash. Yeah, we have to figure out, says Rubber, what's what's Rav Safra's problem over here? The distinction creation <laughs> is so obvious. Why was Rav Safra sweating it out? Right. And the answer is we have to learn our mission again. It says, Lichi Kanesla Notlo. Al Shulchana. He comes home, starts his meal. He's got to terminate his meal for the purpose of Lula. Alma, we see the mafs. Fine. The Hodar Tani. But let's read the end of our Mishnah in Mesechta Sukkah. Lo not al Shachris, he told Benar Bayan. No, no sweat. You know, you didn't take the lula in the morning, take it in the afternoon. No, no rush. Alma Lomafsik. We're, we're not going to tell him to terminate his meal when he has the whole afternoon to take the lula. He's eating pashach. You know, he's having a very, I don't know if you've ever had an occasion to have a hotel breakfast here in Israel. It's, it's mind boggling. My wife and I went, went away for one day. The breakfast was enough for three meals, I'm telling you. <laughs> so he's eating a meal in the morning, and when he gets around to it in the afternoon, he has a full day. Before he goes down to the beach, he'll take the lula. So why does the Mishnah contradict itself? Rav Safa was not asking Akasha from the Mishnah in Shabbos. Mishnah in Shabbos is addressing a mitzvah drabanan, and Lom Afsik would never bother Rav Safa. It's not a contradiction to our Mishnah. But within our Mishnah itself, inherently, from the ratio to the safer, there's a stira. 
In the ratio, we're talking about a case of lekar shahus piyom. And therefore, as we said in the name of the Sfat Seminist, we're not going to give him time and flack to finish his suda. Eventually, he's going to have to stop his suda in order to fulfill the mitzvah of sukkah, of, of love. Let him do so now, immediately. But the sefer, that's talking about a case of ika shus piyom. And if Ika Shuspiyon will allow him to finish his meal. Now it would seem, it would seem that according to Rav's interpretation of Safra, the halacha of Ein Mafsikin, in the case of Ika Shuspiyon, applies even to a mitzvah Doraisa. Because mind you, Rav's premise was our Mishnah is addressing a mitzvah of Lulav Doraisa, and yet. In the Sefer of our Mishnah, in the case where he's in Shachris and he's got plenty of time during the day, we're not going to force him to stop his meal. Omar Rabbi Zeir says, no, it can't be that what bothered Rav Safra was the stira between the Rashi and the Sefer. By Kusha, I don't see any contradiction here at all, such that as Rava would have it, Rav Safra was forced to come up with his distinction. Tilma, mitzvah laf suke. In truth, the Mishnah is telling us that he's obligated to terminate his suda and immediately take the lulo. But for Elo Pasuk, what do we do if he didn't do so and he continued to eat his meal? Ye told Ben Arbayim. Then, he hasn't lost the mitzvah, he didn't forfeit the mitzvah, even though the entire morning went by. He was eating the second seven course breakfast. And you might think he forfeited the mitzvah. No, he didn't forfeit the mitzvah. He didn't do what he was supposed to do. But kalayom kashalulula. And that's the Kiddush of the Sefer. Now, if this be the case, then Rabbi Zera has to come up with another stira to explain why Rav Safra had to come up with his distinction. Because according to Rav Zera, the entire mission is talking about a case of Ika Shahus, and he's got plenty of time. Nevertheless, they obligated him for a mitzvah to raisa to stop. L'chatri, he didn't do so. You know, give him a patch for that. But he's got plenty of time. And the mission says, Kol ayom kasha lulua. Elam Rav Zera, li olam kidam rinon meikara. Let's go back to our original understanding that the stira here is not internal, but rather between our Mishnah and the Mishnah and Shabbos. Udekashalach, and your question, Rabbi, <coughs> why is Rav Safra standing on his head? Our Mishnah is talking about the midst of love, not on the first day, but on the second day, meaning on the balance for the balance of Yonta, that's only a mitzvah of Rabbi Yochum and Zakai's Takana, of Zechel and Migdash, it's all the Rabbanon. So if that be the case, then Mincha is the Rabbanon and Lulav is the Rabbanon. Why is it that for Lulav, our Mishnah requires that he interrupt his meal, whereas the Mishnah in Shabbos, in the case of Mincha, doesn't require that he interrupt his meal. And now we understand why Rav Safra had to differentiate between Ikashus and Lekashus. And now Rav Zera is going to prove to you from the language of our Mishnah that we're talking about the other days of Yontu, not the first day of Yontu. He's traveling on the road. He's on the first day. If it's on the first day, the on the first day, his He's traveling on the road, Mitzari. Are you allowed to travel on the road? It must be that we're talking about Cholamoy. Nobody's traveling on the road on Yantiv. Mm-hmm. Again, you could walk, you know, El Paimama, maybe, yeah. home, but you wouldn't be traveling on the road. You know, you're in a horse and a buggy. That would not be appropriate for young. And this leads us to the second mission. So it's interesting. You know, I would have guessed that the mitzvah of Halel 
would have been incorporated if there was a, if Rebbe had a choice, which Mishnayis, which Masechta he would incorporate the laws of Halil, I would have guessed Masechta Chanukah, because all the laws of Halil are derived from Chanukah. But the only thing is, there is no Masechta Chanukah. So he yeah. had to use Masechta Sukkah. Now, who's reading Halil? Apparently, as we'll soon see, the Midig was that one person would recite Halil on behalf of someone else. And in this case, the Mishnah describes an Eved, an Isha, a Katan that are reading Halil. So the Mishnah stipulates, Ona Achreim Hashem Omri. Whatever words and verses come out of their mouth, respectively, then you have to repeat those words. There's no way that you could be Yotze through the principle called Tomea Ka'one, because that principle requires that the mashmia is a bar chiyuva. Halel is a classic mitzvah sasech man groma. Noshim v'avonim pturos. Noshim are exempt from mitzvah sasech man groma. And the Gemara derives this in Kedushim from Tefillin. There's a special posseg that excludes women from the obligation of Tefillin. And the Gemara says that's because Tefillin is a time-bound mitzvah. In the case of a katan, he's potter from all mitzvahs. So if the katan is reading Halil out loud, then for sure the gadol who has to fulfill his obligation of Halil must be reading along with the makri. Now, imaya gadol makri. So on the other hand, if the person who's reading Halil on your behalf is a gadol, meaning he's a bar chiyuva, then ona achrav haliluka. And that line in the Mishnah is going to be the subject of the Sugya Sagamara. And if you want to like underline one word in the Mishnah, it would be the word One. One means Ania. That in Halil, there's a special kium of Ania. If I'm alone, obviously there's no Ania. Nobody's going to respond to my reading. I'm reading for myself. But at least in the community, if one person is reading on behalf of the community, let's assume that the reader is a bar chiyuva. The members of the community, therefore, could be yotze through Shomer Ka'ona, but no, they have to read along with the makri. No, 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 sorry, that, that's, I went too far. They will have to respond to the makri, and that response is called ania. And the entire oh. Sukkot Gemara is going to set up exactly where they fulfill the Ania, but the key word for Ania is Haleluka, which is actually the first word of Hale. This is already another dimension of Ania. Not with Haleluka, but to sometimes repeat the same possible that the reader has recited. And we're going to see in the Gemara, he already has it here in the footnotes, an entire list of psukim, all of which come from Tehillim Kufyud Ches, in which the call will repeat the same pasuk a second time. Just one example. Kodul Hashem Pitov Kili Olam Chazdom. Yomer no Hashem. All these psukim will be repeated word for word after the reader. So the reader will say the pasuk, and then the kahal will respond. But as far as halal per se, leaving out that one kapitol kufyut ches, there the Mishnah says the call will respond halaluka. And they'll be yotze with Shomer Ka'one. But again, it's a little bit beyond Shomer Ka'one because there's going to be an Ania. Ania, not in the sense of repeating the whole possible word for word, but the Ania and the response of Aleluka. In other psukim, Yechpo. Yechpo means the call will repeat the entire possible after the, after the shots, after the Kore. And apparently there are different minhag. Mishnah says every minhag is acceptable. 
if the minig is lifchol yichol, go ahead. If the minig is lifshot, meaning only the reader recites the bracha and the call doesn't repeat the, uh, recites the pasuk, that's fine as well. And the Mishnah says, levarech, a bracha now, that's also a minig, an issue of minig. Meaning, makom shenogu levarech yivarech. Hakol k'minig amedina. So what, what's going on over here? A halal, like any other mitzvah, requires a bracha, although halal is only a mitzvah dira bona, but nevertheless, we have a bracha on a mitzvah dira bona as well. Proof, to, uh, the proof will be from Hanukkah and, and, and Megillah and Ne'er Shabbos and others. So the answer is, this bracha is talking about the bracha lachreha, the bracha of Yalaluka, which comes at the end of halal. And in truth, we're not exactly sure why the minig, well, one minig was, and that's actually the minig that we adopt, to add a bracha at the end of halal. Every mitzvah requires one bracha. At the beginning, there's no bracha at the end. And we don't uh, sandwich a mitzvah on both sides with a bracha. Bracha meikara, which means over Lassiyas, and that's sufficient. What was the basis for this minog of adding a bracha at the end? Again, I'm just going to throw out an idea here. I don't know. It has to be clarified, but it would seem to me, and I'll give you my uh, precedent for this, that when you have a recitation that's not clearly a bracha, then Chazal established that in order to uh, demonstrate and clarify that there's a bracha here, they added a bracha at the end. I'll give you, I'll give you my example. In the morning, we say, etc., etc., and then we add bracha Hashem, hamachzir neshamos Yisrael, what that could be is that Elokein Tsar doesn't open up with a bracha. And therefore, it doesn't have a, uh, a framework or a geshvanka. It's not obvious that you're reciting it as a bracha. Now, the reason why Elokein Tshamah doesn't have a bracha at the beginning is because of, the, of another principle called bracha smucha lechavert. And we always attach that bracha to an earlier bracha. Let's say Natil Yedayim or whatever it might be. But then you're stuck with a tefillah in which you're thanking Hashem for giving you back your neshama, but there's no structure of a bracha. Right. So they added a bracha at the end. There could not be a bracha at the beginning because it was bumped off by virtue of smucha. So they added a bracha at the end. Now, in the case of Halal, we have a bracha at the beginning, but that bracha is a birchas mitzvah. And it's not integrated into the body of Halal. Just like if I make a bracha on tefillin, the bracha introduces but comes before the tefillin. It's not part of the mitzvah of tefillin. Kriyachma might be different, but that's a different story. So if that be the case, then Halel is sort of left as an orphan. You know, it's not integrated into a structure of a bracha. We need the bracha at the end of Halel to structure Halel as part of a bracha. And if you'll ask me, well, if Halal is a bracha, why doesn't it have a bracha at the beginning? The answer is, of course, it's a mitzvah, and it has a birchas mitzvah. So the birchas mitzvah at the beginning of Halal substitutes for the, for the framework of Halal, and then we need to plug in a bracha at the end of Halal in order to create that kushpanka, you know, that Halal uh, shame bracha in right. Halal. That, that's just what, it, what occurs to my mind. I, I have no, no proof. The MS Omru, Rashi says, Bemis Omru is, is a state where there's no machlokas. You use Bemis Omru. There are others who say that Bemis Omru means halacha levot should be Sinai, but I don't think that that applies here. I think we'll go with Rashi here that Bemis Omru means ein bazem achlokas. Kuliyamalopli. 
Ben Mavarchli of. So now we're talking about Birka Samos. Now this is very problematic. And Rashi comes up with his answer. You'll take a look at Rashi about five lines up before the end of the Yomu. Rashi says, we'll get back to that Rashi in a minute. But what bothers Rashi and all the Rishon? In order to activate the principle of Chomeka Ona, you need a Bar Chiyuva, who's the Mashmiya. Right. Right. He's a Katan. Ben means a Katan. Mm. Now, how can I be Yotze with the Birkas Amosan of my son, who's a Katan? Right. So Rashi gives a very strange answer. What I mean strange is that we, we don't understand it because Rashi says, Wonderful. Higil Echinuch means that he's Chayim Midrabanan. Maybe, right? I'm not even sure of that, but let's let's assume that he generates a chiv to Rabban. We have a principle that a bar chiyuv to Rabbanon cannot be motzi a bar chiyuv to Raisa. So the father is chayv in Birkas Abbas, by virtue of the passage we read not long ago, that's a chiyuv to Raisa. How could the katan, even if he's a gil how could he be motzi his father who's a gadol? So Rashi continues. Rashi mm-hmm. says, in Perig Misha Mesu, Mukim Le, Digon, Chalo Ochal, Aviv, El Kezayis, O Kibet. Now, Kezayis, O Kibet, the Machlokas, Shin Rab Yudin, the Chachamim, or whatever, Rab Meir, whatever it is, he ate less than the Shir Doraisa. So the Torah says, right. of Zavata, and then Beirach. So it's got to be Kedai Svir. He didn't eat Kedai Svir. He had a kezayis of bread. He had a kebetz of bread. So his chiyuv is only the Right. The katan, for his part, is also chayiv bin Rabbana because it's higiel achino. Now, I think there's one piece in this Rashi that's missing. True. Let's say the father had a kezayis, the son had a kezayis. That's that's the amount of bread they had on the table. The father is only chayv to rabban. The katan, then he's chayv in what's called trade the rabban. If he's eating a kezayis, then even had he been a gadol, he would only be chayv to rabban. So there are two the rabbanans here. One is chino, and the other is that he didn't eat the day svir. And we have a rule in Shomei Kona that Chad Rabbanon could be mostly Chad Rabbanon, but Chad Rabbanon cannot, but Trade Rabbanon cannot be mostly Chad Rabbanon. So we're going to have to assume that the Katan ate Kedai Svir. He didn't eat just a Kezayis or a Kebeza. He had a full meal. The father only had a Kezayis or a Kebeza. The Mela is Chad Rabbanon and Chad Rabbanon. whole business is so complicated because the cotton is not really high. I mean, the, the father is obligated to be mechanic the cotton. That's the father's obligation. Anyway, it seems from this Gemara, the way Rashi interprets it, that at least in the case of Birkas Hamazon, the Rabbanan established a chiv on the cotton itself. Right. The famous Kasha of Shimon The cotton is going to laugh at you. Well, why does he have to listen to what the Rabbanan tell him? Ah, because in this week's Pasha it says Lotosu, we call it Shayirucha. But that Lotosu is addressing a Gadol. He's a Kata. Mm. He's not obligated to oblige the uh, and, and recognize the authority of the Chacham. Now, how could the Chacham impose a Chiv on the Kata? It's, like, it's fine, man. I mean, Rav Shimon Shkop was so... What? Even when he's in the time period of Chino. Yeah, but so what? I mean, what, right. what authority do the Chacham have? Right. Are you familiar with the Yiddish phrase, Fife there on it? Have you ever heard that? No. Fife there on it means I'll blow your whistle. You know, Fife there on it means go fly a kite, as we'd say in English. Right. The right. Ramon is telling this Katan he's obligated in the midst of Chino. The Katan is going to tell the Ramon, go fly a kite. What authority do you have over me? The authority of the Chacham is vested in the possible, you know, you're minus small, 
but but that doesn't apply to a cut. He's not included in all cuts, so like he's not included in any mitzvah in the Torah. So I mean, Rav Shimon was so profoundly bothered by this that he said that if you look throughout Shas, we have what's called Ibai Se Makra, Ibai Se Masvara. And the chiv of a katan to listen to the rabbanan is just a svara. Very strange. <coughs> so the brisa says, "Ben misamu ben mivarchli aviv the eved mivarchli rabo." And again, when it says an eved mivarchli rabo, isha mareches labaylo, we're going to have to again introduce Rashi's whole shtikel Torah over here. That the Rav, the master or the husband, only ate a kezayis. And although a woman might not be obligated, according to one side, in Birkas Amazon, on a Doraisa level, because it says, she, she's not part of the inheritance of the land, but Mirabanan, she's obligated in Birkas Amazon. Now we're going to have to assume that her situation is the Rabbanan, his situation is the Rabbanan. And therefore, she can be motzi, motzi here. Or an evan can be motzi as well. Right. Why is he asking a child, his own son in this case, or his slave or his wife, to be mavarek? Why not say the brachi yourself? The answer is he's an amaret. He's an ignoramus. Why don't you learn Birka Samoza? And I have a problem here. I, I don't know, maybe you could help me with this. I, they didn't have printed Sidurim in those days. Birka Samoza is very long and very complicated. Eschatoyen I want to tell you something. Modim to to this day, if I don't have a sitter, I get confused. I start saying the wrong Modim. And I'm no youngster. I mean, I think I'm a youngster, but the, the, the birth certificate doesn't, it seems to contradict me. It's a stira. You don't have to be me asking the stira. So I don't know, Tavo Meira, I don't know why you're cursing and ranking out this guy if he has trouble memorizing and he didn't Ooh. have a printed sitter. Maybe the Gemara thinks he should have written out Birka Samoza with his own handwriting and the manuscript today would be worth millions. You know, sell it on eBay. That's on the top of the of it base. Hilchasa, Rava says, Gibarsa. Gibarsa, I guess, Gibar, like mighty halachas. Niko Lemishma, you could derive me in Hagadahal from apparently our custom. That's why I assume he means by minhaga means our minog in Rav's time. Take a look, Rashi says, Mimashanu noagim, shenoagim, achshav, biyamenu, bibate knesios. Kedem afarish viyazim. No, this Rav is going to analyze piece by piece our minog with regard to halim. Shenoagim lanos haleluka shtei piyamim, velo yosef. That only twice they recited Halaluka, not the way we saw it in our Mishnah, where after every Pasuk they recited Halaluka. The Yom call Halim a Makri, but rather they would, I guess you'd call it responsive reading, and they would repeat every single, every single part of the Halal after they heard it from the Makri. And then to complicate our minog, we have certain psukim where chosim v'karim ima. That they actually repeated word for word exactly what the makri said. So the first part is halaluka, and that was repeated twice, as we'll soon see. The second segment is that they read, it, read along with the shots, with the makri, and the third was responsive reading. The makri would read, and then the kol would. Who Omer Halaluka? Okay, we'll, we'll stop soon. I'll just finish this up. Who Omer Halaluka? So the Makri recites Halaluka. That's the opening word in Halil. Behain Omrim Halaluka. And they should respond with the word Halaluka. So the reader reads Halaluka. 
and then the congregants repeat Hallelujah. Fine. Then, Mikan, where am I up to? Oh, Mikan she mitzvah lanos haluka. So, the first dimension of this minute indicates that there's a special mitzvah to recite Hallelujah. Again, I would put it into my perspective that we're working overtime to try to create a structure of Hallelujah. A heft of Kriyas Halen. So by requiring the Tzibra to, to open up the process by and recite Halleluka, that gives it a Gishpanka of Halen. Number two, who Omer Halu Avde Hashem. And now we have a second Halleluka because now we're getting to the uh, main capital in Tillim, which is Halleluka Luav De Hashem. And now the, the reader is sort of calling out to the tzibur, to the congregants, join me. Halleluka Luav De Hashem. You are the servants of Hashem. You should join on board, join on the bandwagon and recite Halleluka. That's exactly what they're going to do. Fehein Omrim Halleluka. So here I'm going to just read to you. Actually, it's a very long note. So the original... The original minog was that all you had to do was listen to the makri and recite halaluka to each phrase, and then you were yotze. And that was a kula. And that, that kula was extended to include anyone, even someone who is learned, he's capable of reciting halal on his own. However, by the time Rava came about, they no longer relied on that kula and allowed the people just to simply say, Hallelujah. But rather, they required that everyone recite Hallel together, as Rashi said, Emo, Korin Emo, together with the, with the Kore. But what they did do is, they left a certain, like Shirayim, a certain memory, so to speak, of the original Minog, in the case of Haluka Avde Hashem. And you don't have to read that along with the Makri. All you have to do is listen to Haluka Halu Avde Hashem from the Makri, from the Kore, and then recite Haluka. And again, it seems like the reason why this Minig was accepted was that they wanted to have some sort of a vestige of memory to remember that the truth is that one could respond and, I'm sorry, one could rely on the Kriya of the Makri and just simply respond Halleluja. So they wanted to leave something left to the original Minog that just say Halleluja. So they allowed that for Halleluja, Halleluja, Avde Asher. Then we're up to the third Allah. Hu Omer Chodu Lashem. Now we get to that third Allah that we saw in Rashi that we're going to, the congregants are going to repeat after the Makri, not Emo, but afterwards, and they'll repeat certain Psukim. That's the Ania. And Hem Omer Chodu Lashem. And this basically means that the reader, when we get to the last uh, capital, that's Kuf Yud Ches, the first pasuk is Hodu Hashem Kitov, and the Kagarins repeat that pasuk after him. What else? 
Oh, Mikan she mitzvah lanos b'roshe proki. Okay, we'll see if we come back to that. That's already a long discussion. Itmar nami om Rav Chana or Rav Chanan bar Rava mitzvah lanos b'roshe prok. So we'll be in just a minute. We'll come back to that, but first. Let's go on. Who omer on Hashem el Chiyanov? He no omer on Hashem el Chiyanov. Mikad Shem Hayakaton Makrioso. Then onim achrov mashu omer. That's on Hashem el Chiyanov. Now let's go back for a moment to Mitzvah Lanos Biroshe Rocky. Now, if let's say we want to rely on the Kriya of the Makri. Then initially the minute was that we would find hallelujah after every single possible. But when a brand new capital film is begun, a new psalm, then instead of hallelujah, the requirement was to recite at least that very first possible of that chapter. So for example, Tasi Shomi Mitzrayim. Then the people would say, but say Sisrael be Mitzrayim. And that's true for the beginning of every single chapter. And since we're no longer following that meaning, but we want to remember that law, and it shouldn't be forgotten, then the Shirayim was that repeat the first phrase of at least the final chapter, which is Hodul Hashem Kito. And it seems that Hodu Hashem Kitov is the beginning of a new chapter. Now, On Hashem Hoshiyano, we repeat On Hashem Hoshiyano. And Mikan, Shem Hoya Koton Makrio, so then Onim Afu Mashu Omer. And again, the impression you get is this is also a little bit of a shirayim of the original minog, when there were people who were ignorant. And all they found, for example, was a katan to read the halil. Then they would have to repeat what he said, what the makri said. And even though in our minog, let's say, we already have done away with a katan being makri, But nevertheless, the reminder of the original minog is that we recite on Hashem in response to the reading of the of the mak. Hu Omer on Hashem What's this? This is already a new minnow. So already at the time of Rava, they enacted this minnow that they would listen to the Makri and then they would repeat the Pasuk themselves. Not as a, you know, as a vestige of the original minnow when the cotton was the Makri, but rather as a brand new, as a brand new minnow, and not rely on Shomea Kaone. Instead, they required Ania, not Shomea Kaone, but Ania before. Now Rashi points out that this is also a vestige of an earlier din. And that is that you're allowed to repeat psukim in halal. It does not undermine the chefts of kriyas halal. Kriyas halal. Now the truth is, we could have derived that already from on Hashem or We didn't need to wait till on Hashem at Slifan. But since we used on Hashem Hoshiyana to derive the conclusion that a katan, if he's reading, we have to read and repeat what he says. So that was left for that. And then on Hashem Atzlichana as a kiyum of Aniyah, not to rely on Shabbat Ka'one, but to require Aniyah, which I would assume 
is an embellishment of the mitzvah of Kriyas. Who Omer Baruch Abba? Vehein Omerim B'Shem Hashem. Vikan L'Shomea Ke'on. So we're going to split the Pasek into two. The Makri is going to recite Baruch Abba. And the people, B'Shem Hashem. So they didn't repeat Baruch Abba. They just said B'Shem Hashem. And this is meant to remind us of another Allah called Shomea Ka'one. Which means that if he cannot recite the whole uh, Hosek by himself, then if he listens carefully to someone else, he can fulfill his mitzvah. And therefore the Baruch Abba is connected to his B'Shem Hashem, as if he had recited Baruch Abba. That's Shomer. If, let's say, a person listens to the reading that he's obligated in, but he didn't read it at all, Rabbi Chia responded, that Shomea Ka'ona means he doesn't even have to respond at all. So he doesn't repeat the, the recitation. And we saw it really in Hallelujah. I'm not sure about Amen. Amen is Kemotzi Brachami Pivdom. I don't know if you need Shomei Ka'one. Itmar Nami, Omer of Shimon Pazi, Rabbi Yeshua, Omar Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, Mishum bar Kapora, Minayin le Shomei Ka'one. From whence do we derive this principle of Shomei Ka'one? Dechsiv. And now according to Pasuk, in Melochim Beis, it says, "It's called Divrei Asefer Asher Kara Yoshio Melch Yehuda." And the question is, "Vechi Yoshio Kron?" How can it say Asher Kara Yoshio Melch Yehuda? Halo Shafan Kron Dechsiv VeYikreu Shafan. It's called Advar Ma'elus Nei Amelach. Elo Mikan L'Chomea Keone. So Yeshayo is considered as if he had responded to the reading of Shafan, even though he didn't repeat the reading of Shafan. And that's because of Shomer Kona. So Gemara says, Vidil and Basta the Crow, Shafan Kara, maybe Yeshayo actually read it, and he wasn't Yotze with Shmir. Omar of Achabar Yaakov, Lo Salkadaita. It cannot be that Yoshio repeated word after word from Shafan. Dixiv, as the Pasik says, again in Malachim Beis, Yan Rach Levavcha Vatikona Mipne Hashem Bishamacha Esadvarme. Your heart is soft. Rach Levavcha. And Vatikona, you humbled yourself. Where we mipne Hashem before God, when you heard the words of this prayer, the pasuk is emphasizing that he heard, and he did not, he did not read. It. Now we're up to Omar Rav. In the note here, he quotes a group of postgum who say the following. Let's say you're reciting the Amida and the Baal Tefillah is up to Kedusha. You're not allowed to stop in the middle of your Tefillah, Shimon Esrei, in order to respond. Just concentrate on what the Shatz is saying 
without responding. And you could be Yotze Kedusha or Kaddish through the principle of Shomer Ka'onah. And go back to your Amida. And this seems to be Rashi Shita. However, many of the Rishonim reject this Rashi. They say that Shomer Ka'ona means it's as if he actually answered it and he's not allowed to interrupt in the middle of his Amida. Oh, my Rabbi, Lolema Inish Baruch Abba, Vehadar B'Shem Hashem. Why? If he says Baruch and then he says B'Shem Hashem, then it seems that by making a hefseg, takes a deep breath, then he separates the name of Hashem from the Baruch and that's Motsi Shem Chamayim Le Shav. And therefore, he should say Baruch Abba B'Shev Hashem without taking a breath, without any interruption whatsoever. Now, on the top of Daf Lamites, we have a mnemonic device which will introduce the next sugya, Moshe Shapir Ka'amrit, El Hassan Vahocha Suki Milsehi, the Leslan Ba. In fact, many of the Akronim don't even have this in the text. It doesn't appear in the Rif, in the Anyakum, in the Rebbe Nechanano. Amarav Halalema Inish Yehi Shmei Rava Vahoda Mevar. So that will pick up in Ritz Hashem. Uh, tomorrow. Let's make a note here on the top of Daf Lamites Amid Aleph. And God willing, that's where we'll continue. Thank you so much.